I don't think there is any way to be creative without taking chances on your ideas. Because first of all, you take a chance on you and the idea. There are some really creative people and I am not a really creative person, I thought, because I associated creativity with originality. Nothing is guaranteed, nothing. And so if you do have that trepidation, you cannot be an entrepreneur because you're never, never going to take the chances that are necessary. You have to make peace with failure in that the thing that failed was not you. There is that saying, don't quit before the miracle, right? I mean, it's like you do want to keep doing the things that you love, the things that you're good at, the things that get you going, and because you are happy doing what you're doing. Why is creativity so sought after in business, in entrepreneurship, in the arts? You, you, in your book, you have amazing stats. Why is creativity the thing that everybody is looking for? Well, we live in a really big world that is convoluted, as you know, and the history of humanity is one of progress. And without creativity, there is no progress. And without ideas, we perish, literally, because we have houses and we have modern medicine and we have all these things because human beings have been throughout our history curious to find solutions to problems and to improve what already exists. So creativity is vital for absolutely anything we do in our businesses and our lives. And like you will said, it is absolutely necessary for anybody who's in the arts, but it's even more important for anybody who is an entrepreneur because creativity is the root of entrepreneurship. If you're going to go to market with what everybody is doing and there is not a unique element that is original that makes people wonder or attract them to you for whatever reason, you're doomed. And uh, that's what a lot of people, unfortunately, do not want to pay attention to a little bit more closely because they have fall in this trap that says creativity is something that you're born with, that are only a handful of people. And look, in, in all honesty, if an entrepreneur considers himself, themselves, herself, whatever, not creative, then entrepreneurship is not for you. It's, it's funny because I went to film school and I remember on the very first day, I went to film school because I wanted to be an editor. Mm -hmm. I wanted to tell stories by taking bits and pieces. And like, I love the fact that you could make something. And I remember sitting there and on the first day, the professor said, okay, well, what do you want to be? And they go to the first person, I want to be a director. And they mm -hmm. go to the second person, I want to be a director. And then the third person, I, and suddenly you go around the class and, and I, I'm looking around, I'm going, well, good thing I don't want to be a director. <laughs> <laughs> it seems to me like everybody wants to be Steven Spielberg at the time or the director or whatever it is. But as the class went on and as the course went on, I realized that there are some really creative people. And I am not a really creative person, I thought, because I associated creativity with originality. Mm -hmm. Creativity with like a creative is someone who comes up with something completely off the wall that no one has ever thought of that. And, and if I didn't hit this level, then I must not be creative. But I think that's false. And I think that you speak to that really well. Why do we all think of creatives as these, these geniuses who like go off and invent the most original thing? And if we don't do that, then we must not be creative. Well, I think that there has been a, as you said, false assumptions that have been planted by media or certain amount of people who say this is ours and only ours. And it's it's false because creativity is usually incremental. You don't go from zero to Spielberg, right? I mean, it's like if you see his own uh, trajectory, right? He's an incredible idea man who started doing things experimental and then adding and then adding and then he gained momentum, which is a very important thing for creativity because creativity doesn't happen. Creativity is action and it is also an amalgamation 
of skills. That's one of the things that not only I get very deep into the amalgamation of skills in my book, but it's also something that scientists and researchers have been trying to tell the world in their obscure studies. These are people who are incredible as professors and academics and people who are studying people, but don't necessarily express this concepts in a very straightforward way, but it is creativity is an amalgamation of skills. And, you know, I think we've put ourselves into all this incredible pressure that it's got to be like what nobody has seen. And that is impossible. Steve Jobs also used to say everything has already been done. I mean, he wasn't the, the only person who said that, but to think about that, he already said that it gives you a glimpse into how this geniuses also see creativity, because for him is like, look, the MP3 exists and the Walkman exists and these are very poorly designed products. And I think I can do better. And when he stumbled up on the idea of making an iPod, he thought it could also be a phone. And, you know, he also little by little, and also talking to his team, which was an incredible important part of his life was, yes, he was kind of mean to his team, but like you, you cannot be Steve Jobs and be the Dalai Lama at the same time. That's it, it, as simple as that. People have to understand that, right? Like you can't be a billionaire on top of the world and be cute. And I think he has been unfortunately vilified by people who are wimps, Honestly, I mean, look, <laughs> that's the truth. You can't you can't expect these billionaires to be sweet. It's not happening. Go work for Warren Buffett and see if he's going to be cute. Too. You know, like, no, you know, these people are impatient. And if he wouldn't have pushed his team the way he did, we would not have the iPhone. But and that's we, creativity? I think he was an idea man. And you have to remember that he was not a coder and he was not a designer. And that is so important because he never said, if you are a designer or if you are a coder, you're going to find a lot of limitations because it's your expertise and trade that says, there's no way we're going to be able to incorporate all the systems in a flat, thin device that does all the things that this dude is saying. But because he was none of those things, right? He didn't have limitations. So he oh. pushed them and he said, okay, I think we're going to be able to have the touch screen, which actually had started in the Mac, in the in the laptop, in the MacBook, the touch screen thing where the mouse is. Remember that everything that Steve did was like, how do I, how am I not Microsoft, right? How am I not IBM? Let me just be me, well, but, but with what exists, right? And so what existed at the time, you know, was a mouse. And he said, well, what if I incorporate a little thing on? And so people said, no, it's not possible. And then a guy in the team figured it out. I mean, it took time and patience and money and R&D money and whatnot. And then, you know, from that touch screen or touch device uh, for the mouse on the on the Mac, on the on the notebook, that is the glass of the iPhone. You know, I don't know if you've read Ken Segal's book, uh, Insanely Simple. He was the account manager at uh, Chat. I want to say Day. I don't remember the name. I'm, I'm terrible with names. But the agency, who the the advertising agency who helped Steve Jobs come back to Apple, oh, yes. who created the Think Differently campaign, mm -hmm. and then created the Hi, I'm a Mac, and Hi, I'm a PC. And he tells yeah. all these stories. But one story that I love, which speaks exactly what you're saying to, is. In the early days, they were developing at Apple uh, burning software that you can burn um, all your photos onto a, onto CD. Oh yes, or to and DVD, it was right? very complicated. I remember that it was a very cumbersome project and program. It was. They got it down to four. The engineers got it down to four <laughs> buttons, and he walked in and he looks at the board. They get it down to four buttons that the people could hit, and and Steve Jobs is like, "Screw all of this stuff." He draws a big circle and he writes the word <laughs> "burn," and he said. As soon as you guys figure out where the user can just hit this one button that just says burn, that's what I want the software to be. Well, <laughs> and it was like, it's like this, this drive. And, and so what, where I hear this though, is the, the, the vision, the yes. idea, the determination, the courage, 
Mm-hmm. It seems like not only is creative thinking something not the way that I perceived it as this artist who can come up with an originality, but mm-hmm. behind the scenes of this creative thinking is this dogged determination and this belief in your ideas. Is that, yes, is that because something it's, it's, else that we need? Absolutely. It's like it's not just one thing. And depending on who you are and what you do, you incorporate these different traits or habits or skill sets or in whatever way they serve you best, right? I mean, what he didn't have was a lot of empathy. But then you look at Walt Disney and he built a business based on empathy because he cared about families and he cared about kids. And he wanted, like, Disney's main concern was how is everybody going to feel when they are and like, you know, taking a ride in Disneyland, right? How is everybody going to feel when they leave the theater after they've watched Fantasia? How if like, so that is still one of the core principles of the Walt Disney Company is how are people going to, I mean, very different, obviously, with all the different companies, you know, and brands and, you know, Hulu. And yes, so it's a, it's a kind of a different like thing, right? But empathy was something that Steve did not have, unfortunately, right? And then you have a guy like Disney who thrived on empathy and demonstrated it through the products, toys. And at the time, it was toys, movies, and hotels and parks, right? Like, that was it. That was it before he died. And so the vision is the first thing that anybody has to have, right? Because how do you actually create big and large shifts and products and services and improvements if you don't know what you want, right? So I would always suggest go with a really big vision because if you just make it small, you're not going to be motivated enough, I think. And if it's really gigantic and you just have to break it down and see, you know, far ahead in the future and just bring it back to the present and see, well, what is the next thing that I have to do today to kind of move myself you know, a quarter of an inch closer to that vision. And that will give you the different pieces of action, I guess, that you have to follow. And risk taking, obviously, is a big, big thing because nothing ventured, nothing gained. If you're after big things, you have to take chances. And that doesn't mean you're going to bet your house in Vegas. You know, like, it's, it's not that. Like, people, see, we live in a world of extremes. And because everything is so polarized, people understand words with, you know, and without the actual improper context of what it means to be a prudent person. <laughs> you know what I mean? So that also annihilates creativity, you know, being polarized and uh, wanting to just listen to your own echo of your own voice and living on an echo chamber is just the fastest way to lose all your creative ideas and, 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 and to end up just, you know, not really. What I said at the very beginning, creativity is all about progress. But if you can't really listen to anybody who thinks differently, then you're not progressing at all. And that is a very frightening place to be for societies and for humans. You know, I'm taking a few notes here because I've heard you mention earlier, and I want to speak about the skills. We'll talk about those developments, but you mentioned vision and taking on risk, small, small steps, taking action and to make sure that you progress. But it seems to me that the same things that might hold me or you or any of us Mm -hmm. back from being creative might be the same things that hold us back from making that financial investment or from quitting that job we don't want to do or having that hard conversation. It, it's, it seems that, that there is a gap between having the big vision, but then fearing, well, it may never come true or having the skills or not having them and saying, well, I don't know if I'm good enough to develop these things or taking on risk when you go, I can't possibly take these risks, even though they might be tiny. And so how do we get started if if we know that we need creativity to help us stand out? We need creative thinking to help us overcome all of these challenges, to make a better product, to have a better service, to live a, a better life. Like, I want all of those things. And yet, I may not have the skills. Uh, the vision might be too scary or too small. I may not want to take the risk. The action, it just seems like so much work. What do you say <laughs> to, to, to people like us? Because we all do that, right? Yes. Well, um, I think that it's, it's a lot about having confidence 
that what you are set out to do will have great rewards for you and for society and for others. Because at the end of the day, the way that I see creativity is that is your unique ability to come up with ideas of value that have an impact outside of you, right? It's not for me. It is for others, right? And so you would be depriving the world from your amazing idea if you just keep it for yourself. So once you've moved the focus or the pressure from just you and say, well, this has a benefit and that benefit is going to be seen by the world and it's going because that's the thing, right? I mean, we, we do things that help others do things. And that's the whole sole point of like being a business owner is like, or even an artist, right? I mean, you help people see things differently. You plant seeds and ideas of beauty or you challenge their status quo, things like that, right? So I think that when you feel trapped by your own ego or your small self telling you you're not enough or you cannot do this, I think it's important to say, well, but I would like to materialize this idea, but for the benefit of a community or a certain client or a certain group of people. And that usually helps move the ball along the insecurities. But, you know, by the same token, I mean, doing all these things are not huge things. It's, it's just, as I said, it's incremental. And so every day it's about, well, what risk can you take today? Can you, instead of wearing black, wear red? For example, if you're a person who can only like live with one color, right? In your wardrobe or like, you know, <laughs> how that did you know I wear a black shirt all the time? <laughs> Boys usually do, um, you know, but let's say if you're a person who uh, loathes talking on the phone, but are you you're so good on email? Well, so challenge yourself one day to pick up the phone and call. I mean, may, nobody might maybe nobody answers. I don't know. You know, um, so those are little things that are not necessarily going to put you in a position of giving you a heart attack. Right. But it's kind of building a muscle. And then you decide how you combine. I mean, without risk is a very, I don't think there is any way to be creative without taking chances on your ideas. Because first of all, you take a chance on you and the idea, right? And again, if that frightens you, then you constantly put yourself back in the position that this is going to be for the benefit of someone or a group of people or a community or the entire world. And the combination of how you use other things, for example, curiosity is it, it's just sounds so simple, but people are not curious anymore. And if you are the type of person who so? I'm going to challenge you on that. You think people are, are not curious? Not the way they used to. Honestly, if people were to be curious, we wouldn't be polarized. And I'll tell you why. Because <laughs> they know, would dig a little people, deeper. <laughs> well, and they will go and they'll say, well, you know, maybe I'm not the holder of the truth. Maybe there is some validity on the other side of the story. And I'm willing to investigate. Again, like we are seeing polarities that are so, so, so radical that it tells me that people aren't like losing their desire to be that curious. That's so interesting because I'm endlessly curious. I can't help but find myself. If you went through my browser history, you'd be like, what? How can you be looking at uh, this one day and then suddenly you're doing a deep dive on, I don't know, some kind of European political history or something that I end up getting into or um, listening to nine hour lecture on the, the life of Beethoven. It's just like, <laughs> so like I did that and I loved it. So uh, maybe we're a weird breed. Well, I think you and your listeners, because usually people who listen to podcasts have a desire to learn and to, and they're curious, are a different type of people, you know? And, and we have to acknowledge that, honestly, the bar is really low because, again, the majority of the people are not interested in getting curious. When people attain certain level of success, whatever that is for them, they start getting very comfortable and complacent because they've learned very particular ways of doing things that are efficient and work for them. And there is no real need at the moment to go and learn something else or, you know, people are, and this is true, and I understand people are overworked, overtired, not everybody, but you know, there there is a group of people who have really paid their dues, you know, in corporate America, let's say, and uh, they've gone through the ranks and they are burned out. And so one day, 
you know, the boss comes and says, sorry, man, we have to like get rid of your position because we have machines that do it better. And that happens all the time with middle managers and things like that, who've dedicated their lives to do their things very efficiently, but they haven't gotten any more skills besides what they know how to do. And so I know that our audience today is mostly entrepreneurs, but people who actually work in companies have to make themselves indispensable. And how they do that is really by being creative and by learning more new skills and figuring out ways on how to bring, you know, novelty in what they do. And how you do that is like, you've got to dedicate yourself to learn new things every day and to take new challenges that, that will push you out of your comfort zone. And that I think is going to be one of the most valuable, important things that these people can take right now for the future and to future proof, honestly, their jobs and careers. Because um, like I said, it's a convoluted world. We move too fast. Things, technology is incredible. I don't think technology is going to substitute humans completely, but I think that it is, uh, you know, with artificial intelligence and things like that, whatever can be made automatic will be. I, I honestly, you know, I have, I have four kids and I think about the world that they're growing up into because what I've seen is they are in a school system that just seems so archaic to me. And so, for example, my wife and I, my, my wife cares more. I care less about grades. I do not care about grades. I think it's an <laughs> arbitrary system. I think it has to do with how well you test, not how well you learn. And so I've told them all along that there are certain skills that there are or, or certain classes they'll do better at and others they'll do worse at. They'll get better grades or worse grades. I just care how hard they try. And so for me, critical thinking, uh, uh, curiosity, and hard work, I feel like if you can develop those skills, you can, you can almost do anything. And yeah. yet, what are you seeing as the skills, our audience, our kids, what should they be developing to help them become more creative? Listen, what you said is very important. And I quote a, a very important study in my book that was conducted in the 70s by a, a PhD psychologist who was hired first by NASA and NASA gave him an assignment and said, look, I want you to develop a creativity assessment because we need to pull out from our extensive group of engineers and astronauts and like, you know, people who work at NASA are just like incredible, right? But we need the most creative people in that, in our, you know, payroll to put them in the hardest tasks. Because, uh, right, they are also good, but they are not all necessarily creative. So this man and his wife developed an assessment and it worked amazingly well because with time, NASA said, like, you guys were absolutely spot on, right? So what he did and his wife is like, well, if this works so well, can we adapt this for kids? And can we follow them throughout their lives to see how they score? And so they started with the kids on, I think they were five years, four years old, and they followed the same kids with different assessments appropriate for their ages at the ages of 12 and then 15 and then 20 until they were 30. So when they were four, they had a 98% highest score in creativity because they were kids and they found solutions that were incredible and fantastic. When they were 12, it was like half the class. And then they were 15, it was like, well, maybe 25%. And when they were 30, only 2% score at the highest level. And so the findings that Dr. Land, that, that he's, he's dead, but that was his name, the findings of Dr. Land never had to be replicated again because the study was just so solid showing that these kids had lost their ability to really be creative because the educational system had taught them exactly what to think instead of teaching them how to think. And so that is a big lesson for parents to 
either figure out if they just want the kids to follow what exists in the educational system. I'm not saying schools are bad. What I'm saying is, you know, pay attention. Either you're sending your kids to private school or to public school. And are they really learning to think on their feet? How can you stimulate them to have a critical thinking, like you said, and curiosity on, well, first of all, separate them from the video games and the TikTok, not, um, you know, not, not something that, I mean, you're not, you can't separate them completely, but what I'm saying is limit their time. And so that they have also an opportunity to come up with their own ideas. And, you know, I mean, being a parent, I'm a mom and you are a father and you know, these things are, it's not really easy raising kids. And I think that, the whatever parents, working parents can do is to invite their kids to do more activities that require no technology. And, uh, you know, unless you are a fanatic of like coding and you can turn your child into a Mark Zuckerberg, if that's what you want. I mean, like it it all depends on your child too, right? I mean, I don't know. But what I'm saying is that, you know, take them with you to museums, take them with you to learn things about history, uh, you know, challenge them to do crossword puzzles, teach them about, uh, you know, different cultures, take them through like, you know, if like Chinese restaurant or, you know, a, a Caribbean restaurant, teach them about culture. And those things I think are uh, within, you know, the normal scope of, any parent in in a in a city right i mean and take them to trips if you cannot go around the world well then you go outside of your city or outside of your town you know i think that children are very malleable obviously but we don't want them to be boxed in in categories also that oh my god you know you're great at this but you're not great at that right I, like you said the great system isn't necessarily fair and it doesn't really measure a child's honest passions or the real intelligence, especially standardized tests, which are absolutely terrible. The way that they just, I mean, at least in the States, it's just ridiculous. It's the filter, you know, but it's terrible. Yeah, because it's trying to keep, again, for a system that's archaic, but are there skills that we, so if, you know, we're in our 30s, 40s, 50s, uh, you know, we were raised in that system. We might be working in corporate. We might be out on our own as as self-employed or entrepreneurs. But are there known skills that are the ones that are worth putting time and energy into? I think that people have to retrain their self, themselves to how they pay attention to things because that's actually where everything is happening. And we, again... I love technology, but technology has also brought a big problem, which is a very short attention span for a lot of people because, you know, our phones are with us 24-7 and they have news feeds and notifications and text and social media. And again, I love technology, but this has also created a huge dent in our attention and If you are an entrepreneur or you're a business person or you're an artist or whatever, the the greatest opportunities are happening in the periphery, are happening in the places where you're not looking at. Because if they were to be in your trade magazine or in like the regular, you know, conference that you go every year, then you would be already, you know, not banging your head against the wall and how can you do things better? So... It is very important for people to retrain their attentions and to focus on what's happening around them with intent and curiosity. The first thing people really have to do is to have that intention of how can I really pay more attention to what's happening in my community, in my world, and outside of that community. So the 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 places where opportunities are bubbling up to be, you know, taken is usually in the intersections of two industries or in industries outside of ours that we can bring to our own and see if we either borrow or if we either merge two spaces that didn't exist. And a lot of the incredible advances in businesses that we have seen in the past five to 10 years have 
actually started in the margins, like Airbnb was a little app in the margins of the rental business and, uh, you know, and, and the hotel business or, you know, Uber was a thing that somebody was like, well, it's a little bit of, like, you know, well, we, we just don't need that. We have yellow caps and we have, you know, and so they started at the periphery of, of the taxi industry, but amalgamating technology and services and things like that. And it is, of course, a million other things have to happen for those businesses to succeed and to get funded. And, you know, if you don't want to think about that, it's like a huge headache to think about that. How are you going to make the next Uber? That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying, these are very, very big examples that actually provide with a graphic understanding of what I'm trying to say yeah. that in that none of those people also were like hotelier or, you know, a taxi driver. I mean, like, so they come from a different standpoint. I mean, the guys from Airbnb were designers. They, they, they were in design school and they just thought that there was an opportunity for them and they had to tweak the whole thing many times until they found what made sense. And the investors we're like, oh, it makes sense because at the beginning, they just wanted to create an app that was going to open up spaces for people who visited cities for conferences because that's how it just, started. Just to, sleep, just to sleep on a right? sofa. Right. And, like, and, and then their investors sent them off and said, go go take pictures of all these places because they realized yeah. no one knows how to take pictures and go talk to people. And it was like when, two years of them trying to figure out what the hell this when thing could be. they said when they uh, one of the guys told i'm never funding your business because it makes no sense but when they realized that the hotel space was up for grabs that's when the money came in because it was like okay well so how many conferences i mean very things that are difficult to calculate right around the world how many conferences are there in paris or in berlin or you know why would people just want to go to this like apart so but they didn't even know if if people would be willing to sleep on on a stranger's house and if a stranger would be willing to let other strangers in. Well, that's like, a huge <laughs> risk. It's a huge right. risk that they took and the investors took. And that's what venture capitalists do. And that's it's called, you know, venture because it's an adventure. You don't know if it's going to pay off anytime. But, you know, of course, a venture capitalist has funds you know, that are larger than an individual investor and they manage their businesses trying to offset the risk of one company that may just not make it and another one that is just going through, you know, skyrocket. And you you should see like your your life and your businesses like that. You put, you know, your risk on something that you don't want to be left with nothing. You take the risk that you can. You invest, you know, you try online ads and well, shit, nobody signed up. Well, man, you know, you only spend 2000 bucks or, you know what I mean? It's like yeah. you've being an entrepreneur is all is willing to experiment all the time. You and it's so and, interesting. I, I've worked, and sorry to interrupt. I've worked with so many entrepreneurs for so long. And I noticed maybe a year or two ago, and I don't know if this is the case of just the people I work with or if this is common, but it seems that most people who want to start something want it to be a sure thing, <laughs> want it to all work out. Like, like, like I will host, I'll write a play and I'll direct a play and I will open up a, a, a musical if I know I'll have my seats filled. I will invest in marketing if I know that it will pay back within two months. I will, you know, do this thing. I will, I will create this thing as soon as I know it's going to work out perfectly then I'll actually do it. Uh, I mean, that's not how life works, right? No, it's not. And it will be, you know, of course, a consistent source of disappointment for people who think like that. It's better they go work for somebody else. Or, you know, but also, I mean, I, I guess when you're an investor, you want to have some sort of illusionary idea that things are going to work out, right? Because you're not going to write a check for a million dollars or two or 10 or whatever if the if the entrepreneur isn't 100% sure that it's going to work out. But nobody knows. Elon Musk doesn't know if he's going to have a self-driving car. It, even if he says that a million times, which has already gotten him in so much trouble, because 
we don't have the technology yet. The accidents have happened. So, but he has to say it's working because, you know, that is kind of like the, the whole shtick of like, you know, how you sell Tesla is that it's clean energy, is the car of the future. And on top of that, it drives it, it you know, itself. So, but, it, but you have to understand that nothing is guaranteed there is nothing that is sure or secure or that's going to happen for sure nothing and so if you do have that trepidation you cannot be an entrepreneur because you're never never going to take the chances that are necessary and you're never going to recover from the failures either because also being an entrepreneur is knowing that many things won't happen your way. They will fail and you're going to have to pick up the pieces and figure out whether you take them as an important lesson and do not repeat them again, or you just don't learn anything. And, and that would be a tragedy, right? But that's that's the beauty of running a business and going with your ideas is that you have to make peace with failure in that the thing that failed was not you. It was the idea. That's another thing, right? A lot of people are very, very difficult on themselves and harsh on themselves and, and label themsel themselves as huge failures when the thing that failed was a particular idea or a particular part of the business or man, the whole business. And you just have to have, you know, the guts and pick up, you know, your heart and like start from scratch something else because that particular... But that gives a lot of experience. You know, uh, there is a saying on Wall Street that if you're a trader, you can only be the best one if you've lost a lot of money. Because like, and that's the truth. They won't hire you if you haven't been through a lot, of, right? I mean, if you're a senior person or a mid-career person, if you're just going to say, no, I mean, it's like, okay, you're Bernie Madoff if you're lying to us, if you say that everything has been rosy for you. And it's the same thing of an entrepreneur. They're like, you know, actually, I just read a study that says that there were 500 videos from Kickstarter that, I mean, investors and, and entrepreneurs who wanted funding. And it was done initially through Kickstarter. And then these people went and they had in-person meetings or online meetings. And those meetings were recorded for a study. So the people who were most successful in getting the funding were the entrepreneurs who were honest and they expressed a variety of emotions happiness, enthusiasm, passion, and anger when they had to explain all the tribulations, the failures. Because like, you know, if think about it. If I'm a seasoned investor and somebody comes here and says, everything is just fine and so cute and there are no risks and I always do amazing and this, there's nothing negative in my pitch that I have to, I just walk away. I said, this person does not live in reality, you know? <laughs> Uh, you 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 reminded me of I was at a conference in March in Tampa, and this architect Frank McKinney, who um, some people might know, but he's he's an architect who builds uh, in Florida some of the craziest homes, like just I think beautiful I homes. He lives in uh, <laughs> he live in his backyard. He has a treehouse, so his office <sighs> is in a treehouse. He showed up at this conference like in. He, just imagine like the lead singer of Aerosmith with crazy <laughs> purple hair. And he showed a video where he was for his book launch was driving a jet ski at night with fireworks going oh. off them, like, like just completely over the top. And yet when I, when I met this man, like just the biggest heart, great businessman. And he said something at the conference, which I've been struggling to try and internalize, which is you need to turn your craft. You need to become an artist. Right. Yeah. And so and so the way that he's stood out and been able to do some of just the most extraordinary things is because even though it may not have come naturally to him as an introvert or, you know, an engineer mm -hmm. type guy, he's like, I'm I'm going to be an artist. And so so you may hate his purple hair. You may hate the fact that he looks like, you know, he should be in a rock group from the 70s or 80s or that that he does these things. And yet boy, does he stand out <laughs> and, and, and he's different and it seems to be working for him. And I was thinking on Friday as I was thinking through some new things in my agency and talking to you and I was like, okay, I got to be an artist and I want to be more creative and I want to em embody these big ideas and these big visions. I just don't almost know where to start. How do we do this? How do we, how do we live that more creative life? How do we 
be like Frank and, and, and take what we do and turn it somehow into an art form? You know, I think everything is art, but I also think everything is business. So I am very dual minded in that sense, but I do see everything around me is art. And I believe that you can train yourself also to find your style and the uniqueness and what you want to do and elevate that to an art form, right? And that starts obviously with your visuals and the way you look and the way you present yourself. I work in the art world where a lot of people for very strange reasons wear black. I only wear colors. So I stand out because since I started in this business 13 years ago, I just couldn't understand why everybody was wearing black. And I it's love color. So I was... And it hides sweat. <laughs> I'm going to be honest with you. It's very practical well, sometimes why we wear black. <laughs> I, I was just not into that. And so I was very much and continue to be into colors and ideas. I mean, for me, it was always about I am going to pursue the ideas that I have without knowing if they're going to pay off or not within reason, obviously. And I never said no to an idea that I could go after and execute it if it was again. You know, some things were hard and some things were harder and some things were not so hard. But I think that if you allow yourself and give yourself permission to have those dreams and then to execute them in a, in a form and way that sometimes could be a little frightening, but it's you, is your authentic self. And again, not everybody is caught to be an artist. And But I think that your question is very valid for those who want to elevate everything that they do to an art form. If you think about famous chefs, they all are artists, right? I mean, they want to present their food in a way that is like art. They want to run their 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 cuisines and their, you know, restaurants in a way that it's it feels like an experience. And that also is very millennial, right? The experiential is the millennial thing, right? And if you think about how all this you know, so-called museums of ice cream and color and, uh, you know, the Van Gogh immersive experience and things like that um, have brought all this incredible amount of revenues and people in is because they see everything that they do as art, not just the projection on the walls, not but everything is an art form. Your social media, right? How do you show up with your products? You know, are you putting the effort? There's, there's, I don't think that there is an excuse anymore to say, I don't, I don't, I can't, I don't have money to pay for a graphic designer because the apps are so insane, man. I mean, those apps are incredible. The apps is like, I don't know, 25 bucks a year, 100, like the most expensive one, I think is like 90 bucks a year or 60 bucks a year, I don't know, or lifetime. And you get all these templates and colors and things and like, you know, you can spend hours playing with that, right? I mean, but obviously there is a learning curve. And again, let's go back to curiosity and wanting to upgrade your skills, right? I mean, do you want to spend half an hour every day trying to play with the app or do you just want somebody or you just want magic to happen? Like, you, oh my God, I you know, I bought the app and I have no idea. Well, but do you spend half an hour there every day for two weeks to see, you know, play with all the, the different things or, you know, they all have a tutorial video. So everything you do has a possibility to turn, uh, a, a, you know, a, a simple moment into a form of art depending on where you want to do that, whether it is your own persona like McKinney uh, or you want to do it through your social media or you want to do it in the experiential or you want to do it on your website or you just want to make something, you know, the products, that it, the way that you display them. Uh, it, it is individual for each one of us and what we do. But I think that tweaks, upgrades and sometimes entire makeovers can get you there. Well, let's talk about the entire makeover, Maria. How does <laughs> how do you go from being a New York City corporate attorney <laughs> to being the person that we all look to to teach us how to be more creative? I mean, like I I couldn't see those as two totally more polar opposite career paths if if I had to pick these out. How how did that happen for you? 
Well, I grew up in Venezuela and my parents were very, very conservative because society there back then, I don't know, was like that, Catholic, you know, the kind of thing that in this house, you are a lawyer or a doctor or an engineer type of thing. And I wanted to be a singer and I had the skills and I, you know, I, I went to auditions behind their back. And at the beginning, when it was like a little thing for the school, it was OK. But when it started becoming a serious thing where I could have I would have to be on a touring band and like they were like, uh, uh, that's for hookers. And, you know, you're not one of those. So I had to. I don't know, you know, pick up the pieces of my broken heart and say, well, I really don't like blood, so I'm not going to be a doctor. I'm terrible at math. So engineering not happening for me. So I like to write and I like to read and I like justice. So I ended up going to Harvard Law School, believe it or not, which is kind of like a crazy thing. And I, as you are in the whole system and very young, right? I mean, early 20s. And you're like, okay, look, I made it this far. I left my country and I wanted to leave. And I went to Harvard Law. I'm going to get an amazing job in New York City. And it's going to provide safety and security, which is what my parents expected or hoped for me so that I wouldn't have to end up on the street or whatever ideas my parents had, right? And uh, after so many... F, like the efforts, right? Like, and, and sitting for the bar exam and going to like being in a law firm and then changing another law firm and each law but firm was all, better, all along, but I hate them all. all. Yeah, I was going to ask all along, are you like, are you just fighting this like, this, this feeling in your heart or was it fun and then it stopped becoming fun? Was it was it never, challenge? it was never fun because the hours were infinite, right? As you may imagine. And also, I mean, like, <sighs> we need lawyers like, again, like uh, nothing against them, but this is, a, it's a, it's a very strange profession where you live at the mercy of your clients in a very strange way. And it doesn't really matter how fun or interesting. The, I remember, listen, when I, one of the law firms that I work, one of the clients was Shakira. And I thought that was fascinating. And so we had her come in and it was fun. And she was amazing to me. I was very young. But at the end of the day, the job to work for Shakira was drafting some stupid contracts, right? Yeah. And so, like, what I'm saying is, like, it didn't really matter how exciting the clients could be. I mean, those were like, oh, my my two hours of fun with Shakira when she came and we had lunch and we sat on the same table for two hours and she had to sign 25 contracts, right? Like, I mean, and... And then the next day, it was something else that was also another contract with, so, you know, and so it, it was never fun, but I, go, I went with emotions knowing that I was getting paid really well, that I was in New York City, that it's a dream. I'm still in New York City and continues to be an amazing place. And as I grew more disenchanted, because that's the other thing, I was... You know, I was poached by other law firms because I spoke languages and hunters and shit, and they always call you. And so I was like, okay, the next one is going to be the one, right? Like, this is like what I'm thinking, right? Because I was like, I always could find the flaws of where I was. And I was like, well, the next one, that's where it's all going to happen for me. And the next one was the same thing, but it was bigger. And the next one was the same thing, but it was bigger. So I was like, dude, it's not them. It's me. I hate this. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's a hard reality, right? <laughs> yeah. I was like, I hate this. Shit. And so I had, um, I, I sat like I sat down with my husband. I told him, listen, I really need to figure out what to do with my life because I can't be here. It's just crazy. As you know, I am I, at the time, the phones that we had were Blackberries. I had to sleep with a thing under my pillow to like feel the, the vibration when some client. It was just so bad. And I. I got pregnant with my first child and I told my husband, well, now more than ever, I need to figure out what I'm going to do with my life because I can't really have a child and not take care of the child because, you know, but it took a little while because I needed to pour my ideas out. I went and asked things to people. I didn't do crazy. I mean, the crazy thing was honestly to leave a career after nine years. And, you know, it was a big law firm. I had incredible benefits, incredible salary. The bonus was insane. Everything was 
over the top, except my life was in shambles because I hated it. And when I I really took this idea seriously that I needed to like look outside and do something else, I did. And I talked to a lot of people. I had, you know, coffee with people in galleries. I, I you know, I went and I I talked to people who worked in fashion. I talked to people who uh, ha- were interior designers. I did all sorts of things because I wanted to have an understanding of what are they doing? How are they doing it? And could I carve a niche that is different? And so after seeing a lot of people and seeing also um, people who do what I do were not very passionate. I found them to be very boring. I I also thought that... <laughs> all- teaching creativity in a non-creative way? <laughs> no, you know, because I remember that I like my main job is to be an art advisor. So what I do is I build our collections for people. But in the meantime, I also started studying the science and the art of creativity, not only through the artists that I get to you know, interact with on a daily basis, but also through entrepreneurs and professors and researchers that were always very open to answering my questions because I was, since the minute I opened my business, I said to myself, if this is not hyper creative, is going under because nobody's going to come and pay me if they don't believe that what I'm offering is different. And that's exactly what I did. And so that's how I build a business. And in in parallel, I was gathering all this information. And I went and I, I interviewed artists and I wrote about them in my own blog, but also for the Huffington Post and for magazines and L and whatever. And so that was an incredible part of my education as someone who teaches creativity because they are obviously the most creative people. There are no rules of reality. Everything that they imagine can happen in their canvases or in their sculptures or in their videos or in their films. And I that's how I started sifting through the big kind of like themes that are in my book and that are in my course that how how these people come up with their best ideas and what are their habits that they do and so me seeing them was also utilizing what they were doing in my own business as a guinea pig and seeing well if it works for them will it work for me even though if I'm not an artist I can borrow from what I see they're doing in their studios. And that is how this business of mine grew. And that's how I got, you know, my big break and and the big things that have happened to me. It was that I refused to do the things that other people were doing. That is an amazing story. And, And there is so much for us to learn there because I think, you know, Anyone from the outside would say you're leaving a corporate career to go start this other thing, but you didn't you didn't just wake up one day a totally different person. You brought all of your training and all of your skill sets and everything that made you probably an amazing corporate lawyer to this new business, this new venture. And then as you learned everything along the way, you continued to share that. So I think there's so much we could do to just replicate stepping from one career path or from one area of your life into another, which is bring everything that made you great in this one area to the new area, look at it and borrow from other industries or verticals or what you're doing. And then as you go out there and use that curiosity and use that hard work and use that uh, critical thinking to learn these things, grab and almost synthesize the areas that you want to bring in. Um, Ultimately, you know, I mentioned early on in film school, I didn't feel like a creative because I wasn't original. It took me up until about three or four years ago. So so this is like 15 years later <laughs> for me to realize that me spending time tasting and learning and trying all these different things and then somehow they're rolling around in my head. When I get an idea, it may not be quote unquote original. I'm not, you know, Chris Nolan creating a movie that no one can understand because it's so original. But synthesizing all of these different bits and pieces filtering through the things that I'm most excited about. And then me adding my point of view or my wrapper for my clients does create something totally unique and and different. And that's, and I've, I've grown to realize that's a version of creativity that really serves me well. It sounds like that's kind of what you did too. 
Yes. And it's, as I said, it's individual, right? A creativity is how you, uh, it's associative thinking. I mean, creativity is a lot of things, but it is ultimately the genesis of an idea that is original or, or, or unique to you is associative thinking from a lot of things that already exist. And I think that anyone who accepts that there's nothing new and that you're not going to make something that is 100% original, right? Like, as, as a Steve Jobs says, this is our recombination of things that already exist. And that's why we have this enormous amount of resources available to us, right? I, I, like, which is by living, by being present, we get to see what exists and we get to see the deficiencies of things that exist. If you happen to be a person that you have certain passions and you say, well, man, I wish this thing would exist. Let's say if you're a serial entrepreneur, like, I mean, which I'm sure a lot of people here are or like, oh, or in the process of thinking, what would be my next big idea, right? If, if you are, which takes me back to what I said before, if you are paying attention, if you're observant of the here and now, you're going to find a lot of deficiencies. You're going to have problems you're going to you're going to find spaces where you say man i wish somebody would be doing this right i wish you know you may make a google search and find si similar things that are happening somewhere but you can still make them your own and nobody sees the world the way you do nobody has had the same exact experiences upbringing education culture the, the places you've traveled the places you've been the things that you have seen you know believe it or not it, it, it's almost like crazy to think about that absolutely everything that we live in this life is stored in our subconscious because if it, if it were to be outside, we couldn't live it with, it's the truth, right? I mean, but they are there for a reason. And that's where a lot of associative thinking happens. It's like in the, in the not in the conscious, it happens in the subconscious during what, you know, cer certain researchers have called it the incubation effect, right? Like, because there is this um, technique, if you will, like to, to get ideas, right? That people say, well, first you have to be a huge researcher of like certain areas, let's say, that you want to research and you have to gather as much information as you want. And then you have to sort of like organize that data or that information in different, whatever it is, whether it is like, you know, putting them on a Word document or printing them out or just like storing them on files. And then you better move on from that a little bit if you're really trying to find something because the idea, you can't force it. You have to let it, let it marinate in your subconscious where it's going to find all these other things that belong to you and only you, whether they come from the time you were a child or to they have to do with the restaurant you were two weeks ago or a trip you did to London when you were a child, you know, or a teenager or whatever. So you have to allow for the, the incubation effect to do its thing. And that might be something that takes one day, one week or one month, you know, um, but it's important for people to understand that the, the process of generating ideas is simple and it belongs to you. You don't have to go into crazy brainstorming sessions, which also are not good for most people to find solutions to. I mean, it's, it's mostly throwing ideas and then people forget. And that it's because creativity is really individual. And that doesn't mean teams cannot be creative, but it, there's got to be a assignment of responsibilities for each person. Then there is evaluation of those ideas. But, you know, brainstorming sessions are not really where people so find breakthroughs and things like that. I think it's it's it, it, it's like a of a place of leadership that also gets to be communicated to others. And then obviously gathering feedback for an idea is absolutely crucial. But a lot of people just talking randomly in meetings for whatever period of time is not not conducive of, <laughs> of amazing things. No. Nobody has fun in those. So uh, Maria, last question for you. Uh, at the end of the day, what does it all come down to? <sighs> Wow, but that's a very deep and philosophical question. I think that at the end of the day, we all have the ability to impact our surroundings and our families and the people we serve and the communities we serve. And I think that if you 
put yourself in a position where, again, you, you move the ego or remove the ego from the equation and start to measure your big and small successes, you know, as paving the way for doing a better job, you're going to be really satisfied. And with one happy customer, two happy customers, you know, you gain the confidence and momentum to say, I could keep going. I could keep doing these things, right? I mean, I think that you've got to love business. You've got to love people. You know, that's that's important. You've got to love the people you serve. You've got to, um, you've got to have that passion because there are difficult things, right? There are pandemics, there are uh, political shifts, recessions, uh, you know, things happen. And, you know, I think that we don't want to give up on, be, you know, like the, there's that saying, don't quit before the miracle, right? I mean, it's, it's like you do want to keep doing the things that you love, the things that you're good at, the things that get you going and, 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 and have that internal satisfaction that you're doing the right thing because you're serving others, but also because you are happy doing what you're doing. That's why I couldn't be an attorney anymore. And that's why I want to leave people with this message is that there is room and opportunity for growth and expansion and happiness if you're miserable in what you do, I, I, it, you're never going to be as young as you are today. That's for sure. So you, you might as well just take that and, um, and evaluate if what you're doing right now is what you should be doing for the rest of your life.